Well, hello again, everyone. It's Philip Shield. We're talking about being healed from God, by God. This is part three of the series. I hope you'll listen to part one and two as well before really starting this one. But one thing I know of is when we go to the book of Acts and we look at the epistles and we look at the gospels, what we find out is that there were an awful lot of healings going on. And so some people have concluded that God just doesn't heal like that anymore. Obviously, he's not. But is that because of him or is it because of us? Has the age of healing stopped? I don't believe so. I really don't believe so. Has God lost his power to heal? Of course not. Of course not. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God Almighty, you have all power. You have all means of working any miracle you want. All we have to do is believe in you and be it according to your will and whatever you want gets done. We come before you on this sermon, this teaching. Father, I just ask that you will open the hearts and minds of those listening to it. You've revealed some things that I haven't myself preached that much, if at all, and am not hearing preached. I believe, Father, that you have revealed these things, that if we would all practice all eight keys I'm going to reveal from you, that there will be more healings. Healings in Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus, by his power and his presence. So we lift up holy hands to you in prayer and just ask you now to look down on us with joy. Hear this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Why are we not seeing far, far more healings than we're seeing? What are we doing that may be preventing those from happening? What can we start doing that we aren't doing already that would open floodgates of healing? How much power do we have that God has given us inside of us that we can use in his name, by his power, by his will, by faith, by believing in him. I think you're going to be blown away when you see how much power we really should be using and what the Bible says we have. So in part one, we talked about how God, I gave story after story of dramatic, astonishing, wonderful healings Many were instant. A few of those stories were not instant, but were still, still spectacular. Healings I've been involved in or heard about. And I hope you will hear part one, because faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God. The sermon is not exactly the Word of God, but it's still the Word of God that you're hearing, stories. So I'm giving this series to try to find out what are we doing wrong? What's missing? We should be getting more healings than we're getting. Some of you have been spectacularly healed. And others of you are suffering and suffering badly because you haven't been healed. So let's talk about that. The early followers of Christ didn't just, when he sent them out, <clears throat> the 70 and so on, he didn't say go out and pray for the sick. It's not what he said. He said go and heal the sick. Cast out demons, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. And they went out and healed. So that's what we're talking about today, is what has changed. So that's part one, stories of healing. So you, so you all fully understand healing still takes place. Part two, I talked about the various ways that we show unbelief that we may not even realize we're showing unbelief. So make sure you hear part two, because uh, even the very Son of God, Jesus Christ, Yeshua himself, could do no mighty miracles in Nazareth, where he, was, where he grew up, because they didn't believe, because of their unbelief. Mark 6, verses 1 to 5. If you haven't heard part two, please do. Yeshua said a person was being healed because of their great faith over and over and over again. And then even to the man whose son was possessed of an evil spirit. Yeshua asked him, Jesus asked him, Mark 9, 23, Yeshua is his Hebrew name. 
If you can believe, all things are possible to those who believe, to him who believes. And the man says, yes, I believe, Lord. Oh, help my unbelief. A very honest reply, but not necessarily a model that we're supposed to follow. We're supposed to get rid of unbelief. Because if we believe, nothing can be held, held back. But because of unbelief, Jesus himself scooted people out, out of the room. If he was going to pray for someone or resurrect someone like Jairus' daughter, he scooted them all out except for the parents and, and I think three apostles or disciples and himself. So I'm sure most of us need to check our levels of faith and trust and belief, no matter what we're seeing and feeling, no matter what we're seeing, no matter if the pain's getting worse, no matter if the cancer's getting worse, no matter if the person's even dying and been given a certain limited time to live. There's a preemie I prayed for, it's in story in part one, I was told by the doctor, don't you be going, giving any hope to that mother in there. This premature baby, five months along, one pound, four ounce, may not last today. By the end of tomorrow, we'll be gone. We'll be dead. And I said, there's a God in heaven who just heard what you said. You're going to eat your words because that little baby is going to be healed. And she was. Little Nikki. Still bouncing and alive today, 25 years later. So don't excuse away your unbelief. Excuse me, well, I get some bad itch in here. Uh, don't excuse some unbelief as being normal. The man who said, the Lord help my unbelief, that wasn't, uh, that wasn't a model for us. Okay, um, do you want to see more healings? Then remove unbelief. Realize that it's the devil, the thief, who wants to steal away healings that you can have. John 10.10 10 says the thief doesn't come except to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus said, but I have come that they may have life and that they may have it abundantly. So Satan wants to take away your healings. Satan wants you to believe that God doesn't heal like he used to. Satan wants you to believe that what you have is too hard too far gone to be healed. Jesus is saying, no, no, no. Speak life. We'll talk about that. Abundant life. And that includes healings. Be sure when you pray your will be done that you're not including in your feelings as you say your will be done that I'll bet his will is not to heal me this time. Don't go that way. Don't be assuming God doesn't want to ever heal you. God wants you healed. That can happen, but usually... God wants us healed. I believe God wants to heal us. I believe God's will is to heal us. I believe almost every time that would happen. If we fully believe, we must believe. But caution. I am not saying that those, as some have said, I am not saying that those who are not being healed are not being healed because they lack faith. I've heard ministers say that. Timothy had often infirmities. Elisha, who healed people, died of an illness. Paul had a thorn in the flesh that wasn't healed, whatever that was. So I'm not saying that it's lack of faith every time that keeps a person from being healed. But unbelief can certainly derail a healing that might have taken place, would have taken place, like, like we've been saying in Mark 6. I have a man named Paul. Paul Gibson, please pray for him. But pray only if you have tremendous faith. Pray for Paul Gibson. He has MS so bad. It's getting worse so far. Can't move anything from his neck down. Can't even talk much anymore. And he gets various illnesses and, and pneumonias and so on. Even though Paul is not being healed, I don't believe for a minute because he lacks faith. In fact, in the fact he's not being healed is one way that he is a testimony, a living witness of someone whose faith is in God no matter what. So even if you're not being healed, you can still 
give glory to God by the way you live your life with that problem, not losing faith in God. So to those of you who are unhealed, brothers and sisters, you can witness like the Apostle Paul did in 2 Corinthians 12, I believe it is, where he talks about, in my weakness, uh, he's made God is strong. And my, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. And verse, uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 12, verse 8, for example. So I'm not saying that everyone not healed is not being healed just simply because they lack faith. I'm not saying that. It's true for some, but it can't be true for all. Our job is to heal. I mean, is to pray for healing. God's job is to heal. God is the healer. The minister is not the healer. I know there are verses that says in Peter, healed this one and the apostles healed those. The healing comes from God, working through people who have faith. Neither am I claiming that when I pray for someone, every time they're healed, they're absolutely not. And that's why I'm giving the sermon series. I want to find out what on earth is going on, that we're not seeing a lot more healings than we're seeing. By the way, I was supposed to be have been a still a stillbirth. My mother had been told that there was no heartbeat, no sign of life at all in, in, in this baby that became me. I was uh, anointed for and prayed for by a minister. And then uh, two weeks later, I was born. Two weeks later, I was born. And my mom had been told that I was already dead in her womb. No heartbeat, no vital signs. So God's been involved in healing in my life for a long time. On the other hand, our first son, we had had two daughters, and our first son uh, was born two months premature. He had an umbilical cord wrapped around his neck real tight for 15 minutes. And I believe there were some consequences for that. He lived for a while. and In fact, when we took him out of the hospital sometime later, the nurses all said when they, they were there when I anointed him, uh, this son of yours is leaving the hospital today by the power of prayer and faith. Well, <clears throat> that was great. But then some months later, we found him suddenly dead on the bed. I thought he'd been healed, but he hadn't been. And he died. My first boy was deep blue in his face, not breathing. So I've had to face this not being healed issue as well. And though in part one, I gave you lots of stories, lots of stories about my own healings. I still have, as of this minute, issues that haven't yet been healed in my own body that I'm praying for. So don't think that I have got this magical gift of always being healed. I, I have it. I wish I could. So I've had to face times of no healing as well as anybody else. But one big reason that some aren't healed in those trials, we grow. We grow. I mentioned Paul Gibson already. If we were all healed at once, instantly, every time a prayer was made for you, where would the testing of your faith be? We grow stronger spiritually when we have to keep asking. Keep waiting in faith because we're still sick. We're still in pain. The issue hasn't gone away. We're still paralyzed. Even the father of the faithful, Abraham, he had to wait 25 years from the time God told him that he would have a son. 25 years they had to wait. And God made them wait until it says Abraham's body was as good as dead. It was impossible for him to have a child, to conceive, to beget a child. Impossible. He was too old. Things weren't working anymore. God healed that, gave him Isaac, then he seemed to have been healed of that from then on. But God waited till it was humanly impossible for them to beget a child. So the testing of our faith is critical, critical, critical. There's a billboard that I, I've seen that says, or heard about, that says, Calm seas, calm seas do not produce skilled sailors. So our life is not going to be calm sea all the time. C-A-L-M, calm seas, do not produce skilled sailors. So God doesn't always heal quickly, quickly or even all the time. So that our test 
So our faith can be tested. <clears throat> First Peter 1, verses 5 to 8. You who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. First Peter 1, verse 6 now. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Did you see that? That the testing, the genuineness of your faith may be tested, though it's tested by fire. Genuineness of your faith. That's why sometimes we're not healed. We're, we're, God's testing our faith. That's why Abraham had to wait until obviously he couldn't have done anything to concede the child, to beget the child. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 17 and 18, for our light affliction, 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Those of you who are still waiting to be healed, while we do not look at the things which are seen, don't look at the lump, don't examine the pain, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So there's always a purpose for being healed and there's always a purpose for not being healed. One of the purposes is to exercise your faith and have it refined. Have it get stronger, in fact, when you're not healed. Calm seas. Calm seas do not produce skilled sailors. Are you being punished if you're not being healed? Even my own brother just the other day, not healed from his strokes and problems, and he's lying there in bed, unable to move his whole right side and in pain and different things, wonders if he's being punished. It just broke my heart to hear that. What have I done, Philip? Is God punishing me for some sins that I had from law? And I said, Lord, no. When you repent of sins, it's gone. It's gone. Jesus took all that. Jesus took the wrath. Jesus took the punishment. He wonders if he's being punished for some sins of the past. When we're not healed, that's a normal, a common question that comes up. Or did my dad and mom do something? Is this a generational thing? You've heard that too, probably. But again, remember, we can grow, we can be tested, we can be refined by the fact we're not being healed yet. I'm going to talk about being healed much more, the positive side of it, in just another minute or so. But, but I want those of you not being healed or who won't be healed not to give up either. Your faith is being tested and refined. And there certainly are examples of people whom God did punish with physical maladies. Miriam in Numbers, Numbers 12, I think it is. Miriam, and uh, the prophetess Miriam, was saying things about her brother, her young brother Moses, and Aaron was, was siding with her. And God suddenly appeared at the front door and says, come out here, both, you know. And then he said, how dare you? And God, God put leprosy on her, I think it was for a week or so. And the Herod, well, I was eaten by worms. Herod was eaten by worms because he refused to give God the credit. And um, there are many other examples as well. Um, uh, in fact, Exodus 15, 26, God says, I am, I am uh, Jehovah Rapha or Rofika, something like that, your healer. God, your healer. It's just coming to me now. Uh, and he says, I will put none of these diseases that I put on Egypt. If you'll obey me and stay close to me. So, you know, we, I, I tend to shy away from the connection that there's some connection often mentioned in Scripture between illness and sin. There is that connection there at Passover. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, Paul says, this is why many of you are sick and some are dying. Because you're not esteeming the body of Christ near the end of 1 Corinthians 11. That also just came to me as an example of this. That's why many of you are sick. And back in Hezekiah's day, 
they had a, a wonderful Passover, but everything was rushed and people didn't properly cleanse themselves and get ready for it. God was upset and he sent an illness, a plague. Hezekiah play, uh, prayed for mercy. God removed the plague and healed the people. But again, God put a problem on there because of their disobedience at first. They weren't doing things like they should have. So that is possible that a person is being punished. But once you've gone to God and prayed about it and repented of anything at all that it might be, uh, leave, leave it alone. Leave it alone. Let God know. I mean, was Abraham being punished for having to wait 25 years? No. Okay, so it would be prudent and wise to repent of any sins you're aware of, certainly, and then ask God again to heal you. Sin, forgiveness, and healing, they are connected several times. In James 5, verses 14 and 15, is anyone among you sick? James 5, 14 and 15. Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord, anointing him with oil. You ministers need to carry a little packet of a little vial, a little bottle that I keep in another little container so it doesn't spill in my pants or something or my coat of olive oil. Carry that with you. Have it with you at all times. Don't be found without your oil, ministers. You can order them online, Amazon, anointing oil and little, little vials. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. And if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. So that's a real good tie-in right there, that if there are sins, it doesn't say, and because of all the sins, sometimes there is a sin involved. And um, so yes, sickness can be connected with unrepented sin, but once you've repented, uh, don't continue feeling unworthy of being healed. Please don't. Even the sick man of John 5, there was a man, there was a pool of Bethesda. Okay, pool of Bethesda. And Bethesda, mean, the Beth means house, and Bethesda means house of grace. And it had five porches. Five is the number of grace as well. And it was near the sheep gate, which also points to sacrifice and, and the actions of God. And Jesus showed his grace to all those people that were sick there, waiting for the angel to stir the water, whatever the story was there in John 5. He picked one man. One man who was not righteous, apparently. He picked that one man. And so, like I said, there were five porches, number of grace. Jesus healed him on the Sabbath. We know this man was not righteous because of what Jesus said to him later on. He healed him first. He was healed instantly. Rise up and walk on the Sabbath. John 5, 14. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple, the temple complex, and he said to him, uh, See, John 5, 14. John 5, 14. See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. So that also is a connection of sin and healing. And uh, But here Jesus said, be careful. Don't, don't keep doing whatever he was doing that were sins. But when we see someone, sometimes that someone is ourselves, not being healed, we can rush to this conclusion it must be for either lack of faith or some bad sins that they have. Uh, or I'm being punished for some bad sins, like my brother was asking me. But let me remind you <clears> of <throat> several things. What I'm about to say is very important for those of you who are thinking that way or ever think that way. In part one, one of the most incredible healings was for this 25-year-old lady named Michelle, whom I spoke with just not long ago. She wasn't attending church. She had become pregnant out of wedlock. One of the most miraculous healings of her preemie, one pound, four ounce preemie, just a little thing. And then she herself was hemorrhaging and having problems. And when I touched her, I hadn't even prayed yet. But when I touched her feet as I went around the bottom of the bed to her head, she jumped up suddenly. She felt this surge of energy come up from her feet through her body to her head and back down again. Her mom against one wall and her boyfriend against the other wall also jumped up in a way because they were startled. They saw a bright light. I didn't see the light. They did. There was power that went out 
When I touched her feet, she was not attending services, keeping Sabbath, praying, seeking God. God healed her. It was one of the most spectacular healings I've been involved in. And her baby. Fair enough, though, that when you're not living a life of sin, or when we are living a life of sin, we just don't have the confidence that we would have if we were living a more righteous life. 1 John 3, 21 and 22 it says, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, 1 John 3, 21, 22, we have confidence towards God. When your heart's not condemning you, you have confidence. If I'm asked to pray for someone and I've just done some horrible sin, I don't have that confidence that God's going to hear that prayer. So, whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. So, yes, it's important to be close to God, but I'm just saying to all of you that God's healing has often been with people who are quite evil. But even having said that, we don't find in the record, except the one I gave you in John 5 at the Pool of Bethesda, said no more lest the worst thing come upon you, that Yeshua never did an inventory of people who wanted to be anointed, who wanted to be prayed for, who wanted to be healed. The apostles didn't either. You don't have any record of them saying, okay, tell me, have you been attending church services regularly? Are you tithing? Are you being a faithful husband, faithful wife? Um, do you keep the Sabbath correctly? There's no, no history of any of that happening. They simply healed. They didn't ask people about their spirituality. They just simply healed people. We had a minister visiting with us one time um, <clears throat> when I was up north. And we had some people to anoint for healing. And he said, I, I, I'd love to do this one. And when I was there with him, I couldn't believe, I, I was aghast that he, that I, I was shocked that he was going through this litany of questions for this woman. Have you been faithful with your tithing? What are you like as a mother? What are you like as a wife? And I finally stopped it. I said, let me, let me pray for this woman. I, I want to do it now. And I just went ahead and prayed for her. And I told him later on, I said, I see no reason to do all that. Nothing in, nothing in the Bible about that except that one example in John 5. There's no example of them going through a litany of questions. So let's go through the eight keys for healing. I believe with all my being, if you and I will fulfill these eight keys, we'll start to see healing happening more and more in the church. Number one, to be healed. Believe, live by faith. Believe in, have faith in God through Jesus Christ through the power of Jesus Christ living in you to heal you. Believe, 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 have faith. You all know that point one. I promise you when we start getting to point four, five, six, seven, eight, you're going to hear some things we're not always preaching. So, but first of all, we just read it. When someone's sick, call for an elder. Let him come and pray for you. Then I'd have no problem. I'd have no problem after being anointed and prayed for if the pain and problems did not go away right away. I have no problem telling you it's fine to go see a specialist, a doctor. It's fine. Some of you have been told in where you attend that going to go see a doctor or getting medications is a lack of faith. No, 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 it isn't. In Luke 5, 31, 32, Luke 5, 31, 32, in fact, I would say pray to God to guide you to a good doctor. God has guided me to a really good endocrinologist, one of the best in the country, apparently. Really good. Very thankful for it. So pray for that. Pray that they, if they give you medicines, that they'll be ones that won't cause bad side effects. Luke 5, 31, 32, Jesus answered, said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Those who are sick need a doctor. Jesus said it. So if you want to argue with me on this, go argue with him. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. But here again, healing 
and, and our spiritual condition is tied together. We're going to come to that more later. Don't be like King Asa, however, A-S-A, -A, uh, who apparently in 2 Chronicles 16 got some horrible disease in his feet, very painful, and it says that he only saw the physicians, did not seek God. So don't do that. Seek God first. Get anointed. If the problem persists, sure, it's fine. Go see a doctor. It's okay. Okay? Don't put some man-made regulations onto you that you don't need to have. So it's fine to get anointed, prayed for, and then see a doctor. Scripture again, Luke 5.31. The sick need a physician. Some of you are going to argue about that. Argue with Christ. Over and over we can read, however, that it is according to your faith. All I said about the physician is that that doesn't mean that you're losing faith if you go see a doctor. Still keep your faith in God. The blind man, uh, Mark 10, 52, your faith has made you well. <clears throat> Other blind man, Matthew 9, 29, same thing. The centurion's faith. Matthew 8, 13, as you have believed, so let it be done. In fact, Jesus said, I haven't seen such faith in all Israel except this Gentile Roman soldier, centurion. It was over 100 men. Matthew 15, 28, great is your faith. He says to a Syrophoenician Gentile woman, great is your faith, your desires be done. So number one, check, check, check your faith constantly. Are you starting to doubt at all? Pray that God wipe that out and get rid of it. You don't want to have lack of faith going on. You want belief going on. Now, we can't work up the faith, though. The Bible says in Romans 12, 3, that we're all given a measure of faith. So we're all given that as a measure of faith. Romans 12, 3. Ask God to cast out all doubt that you're maybe feeling at all. Any unbelief. Faith is what? Faith is complete and total trust, belief, and looking to God, confidence in God to do what he promised, what he says he'll do. He'll do it when he wants to and how he wants to, but we have faith in him that it will be done, that he exists, that he hears our prayers. It's being sure of what we hope for. The NIV Hebrews 11.1 1 says faith is being sure of what we hope for. Abraham you know, when God told him, he finally gives him a son, waiting 25 years to have this son. And then God says, I want you to sacrifice him. We read in Romans 5, I think it is, and other places in Hebrews 11, that he saw his son as in a figure. That even if I have to kill my son, God, because I believe he cannot lie, is going to have to resurrect him. There had been no resurrections yet. Up till that point. But even when he went up to, with Isaac in the wood and the fire and the knife, he told the men who had, who had come with him that far, my son and I are going up to worship and we will return. I think that's in Genesis 22. And we will return, as many translations put it. He knew they both had to return because God had to be faithful to his promise. That's the kind of faith we have to have. Faith is being sure of what we hope for. Faith focuses on trusting God. We spend our time looking at God's word. We spend our time praising him in spite of whatever we're feeling and going through instead of spending all that time looking at the doctor's reports and trying to go to, uh, what is it called, uh, meds.com or, or uh, you know, anyway, I, I don't even go to it anymore, but I, there is a website where you can find out all about your maladies. Instead of spending your time there, go to God. Faith resists, or rests, I mean, in whatever God decides. So yeah, well, you can say your will be done. There are some preachers out there that say when you say your will be done, you're showing lack of faith. I don't think so. We want God's will to be done. Real faith, uh, he may decide not to heal us. He may decide not to heal us just yet. He may decide to test your faith. He may even decide to let you die. You know what the death rate is, the percentage of death of humanity? 
If we live long enough, you know what the percentage of dying is? It's 100%. It's given to all men to die once. And after this, the judgment. At some point, you've got especially an elderly person, and 96 years old or 102 years old, at some point, God's going to let that person die. And it's okay. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. One of the scriptures says, precious. And there's another verse that says, God takes the righteous away so they don't see and go, go through the evil to come. I'll put those in the notes. Just come to me now, so I need to put those in the notes. So anyway, so faith accepts even death without doubting God. Believe, believe, believe. Although having said that, two in Scripture, one was Hezekiah. God said, get your affairs in order, you're going to die. Hezekiah prayed to God, weeping, and God told Isaiah, who hadn't even left the palace ground still, go back and tell him, I'm going to give him 15 more years. I've heard his prayer. We hear somewhere else, by the way, that Hezekiah didn't show enough praise and gratitude to God, which upset him a little bit for having done that. I didn't realize that before. The other one was Ahab, evil Ahab. God said, you're going to die. But he went around quietly, softly, mourning and repenting, I guess, as best he knew how. 1 Kings uh, 21, 25 to 30, uh, 29, 1 Kings 21. And God said, okay, it won't happen in your life. I'll do it in the life of your son because the whole family was evil. So anyway, God can decide to let us die or not. That's point number one. But believe like crazy, believe. Point number two. How much power do you have inside of you? You and I have none. According to John 15, that without me, you can do nothing. Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. The, vine can, uh, the branch cannot exist by itself unless it's attached to the vine. So without me, you can do nothing. There are some out there teaching that we have innately inside of us all this crazy power. Don't misunderstand what I'm going to say with that. We can do nothing on our own. But with Christ, like Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13. So how much power do you have inside of you through faith in God? Not faith in yourself. John 14, 23, Yeshua, Jesus said, answered them and said, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. John 14, 23. If you love me, you'll keep my word, and my Father will love him. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. We'll come live inside of you. So we are now the temple of God by the Holy Spirit coming into us. The temple of God. God is inside me. God is inside you. Other scriptures make it real clear that God is in us by his spirit. 1 John 3, 24, verse, the last half of the verse. Galatians 4, verse 5 and 6. So we have the spirit of the Son of Christ in us, saying, Abba, Father, just like he did. The Spirit is not a third person of the Trinity that we pray to, though. The Spirit is the God's power, God's nature, God's presence. It's not a separate being. So don't ever pray to this Holy Spirit. Sometimes I hear people doing that. Holy Spirit, do this. Holy Spirit, do that. Don't do that unless you believe in the Trinity, which I don't. The Trinity requires co-equal, three persons co-equal, there's one who is God Most High. You can't have several who are all God Most High. God the Father is God Most High. The Word is under God. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 2 or 3 says that the head of Christ is God. Okay, The head of man is Christ. The head of Christ is God. So Christ is not the same power and equal as God the Father. So we don't believe in the Trinity. Don't be praying to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not a person. The Holy Spirit is the presence of God. I have a whole sermon on who and what is the Holy Spirit. You've got to hear it. You've got to hear it. So the Spirit is the nature, the power, the nature, 
and the presence of God and Christ inside of us. 2 Peter 1, verses 2 to 4. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord as his divine power, as his divine power has given to us, his power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Verse 4, by which we have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may you and I may be partakers of the divine nature. Goes on from there. So verse 3, verse 2, verse 3, his divine nature has given us all things. Second Peter 1 verse 4, that you may be partakers of his divine nature and his power. His divine power, his divine nature is now inside of me because Jesus said, if we keep his word, Father and Son will come and live inside of us. It doesn't say Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. They use the Holy Spirit to come, but it's not a third person. It's not a third person. What could possibly limit us if we believe this? You have access in Jesus' name, in Yeshua's name, to the incredible power of God Most High in Yeshua inside of you. The power that spoke or commanded and they were created, the whole universe. Luke 6, 19, and the whole multitude sought to teach, to touch him, Jesus, to touch Jesus, for power went out from him and he healed them all. He healed them all. Power came out from him. Now the same one who had power coming out from him is now inside of me and I saw and experienced that power with the healing of Michelle 25 years ago when that power came out from God through me into her and she jumped up in her, in her bed. I mean, sat up, I mean. When she felt that, I confirmed all that in a phone call with her recently. When Jesus was touched, by the woman who had a terrible blood flow, hemorrhaging. And he said, who has touched me? And he said, I felt power go out from me. In Luke 8, 41 to 48, I felt power go out from me. <clears throat> Again, John 15, 5, Yeshua says, when we abide in him like a branch abides in the vine and he abides in us, we will bear much fruit, for without him we can do nothing. But he implies, but with him we can do everything. And that's what Paul tells us in Philippians 4.13. So are you getting how much power you have? The same power that resurrected Jesus from the dead. Paul says in one of the scriptures, that same power is now in us. That same power that spoke the universe into existence is now in you. You can't use it yourself unless you go through the name of Jesus Christ, though. God now dwells in you. God is now your power in you. Wow, talk about power we have. But I think many of us let it sit there dormant. But we dwell also in God, like 1 John 4, 15 says, if we abide in Jesus and abide in love. God abides in us and we abide in God. 1 John 4.15 Colossians 3.3 3, You died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Then verse 4 says For Christ who is our life when Christ who is our life returns Okay, Christ My life should now not be Philip Shield should be Jesus Christ. So get this <clears throat> Now when you and I pray for something in Jesus' name we're unleashing not because we have power, we're unleashing God's very power. The power of the universe that created the universe for he commanded and they were created. Psalm 148 says, God's very own power is inside you now. Even if you're not a minister, you can pray, you can do things and use that power in Jesus' name. 
It's the same power that said, let there be light, and there was light. So when you pray, <clears throat> don't just pray in your power, because you don't have any. Pray in the power of God, the power of Jesus. Even Michael, the archangel, powerful being, who defeated Satan in the past and will again in the future, near future, when they were contending over the body of Moses. He didn't just use his own power. He said, may the Lord rebuke you, Satan. May the Lord rebuke you. That's in Jude 9. Yeshua even asked the apostles, why aren't you praying in my name? I keep hearing people praying, but they aren't saying in Jesus' name. Don't do that. You're wasting a prayer. <laughs> or at least not maximizing it. Maybe God will be merciful to you if you don't understand this. But understand it now. John 14, verses 12 to 14. Assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do. And greater works than these, he will do because I go to the Father. Yeshua, Jesus just said, you will do greater works than even he did. If you believe. If you believe in him. I don't think Jesus was lying. I think he meant that. If we're not doing it, I don't want to explain that away, that he didn't really mean it. Don't explain his words away. Verse 13, whatever you ask in my name, in Jesus' name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. John 14, 14, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now other verses say it has to be according to God's will. But ask, John 16, 23, 24, in that day you will ask me nothing, but most assuredly I say to you that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you haven't been asking anything in my name. Ask, ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. He says, quit this thing of not asking in my name. Do it. Ask in my name. Are you receiving this? Or have you fallen asleep and not, not going to do it? This is a huge, huge point. Any of you ministers praying for the sick, always end your prayer. And during the prayer, in Jesus' name, we're asking the power of the universe that's inside of me, that's dwelling in me, that's abiding in me, to come out. And I even say things like, Father, my hands can do nothing. But your hands, through Jesus Christ, Jesus' hands can heal. So let his hands be the hands that touch this person. In Jesus' name, may this power be, be done that this person can be healed. All right, so point number one was live by faith. Trust God, look to him, find out where there's any areas where you're lacking faith. Point number two is receive and accept and confidently use in Jesus' name and believe in this incredible power that you really do have, that God has put inside of you. He is abiding inside of you. And then we're also told to come boldly before the throne of grace that you may receive help in time of need. Hebrews 4.16, I believe that one is. Come boldly before the throne of grace that you may receive help. In Acts 3, there's a healing of a lame man by Peter and John. Without hesitation, they proclaimed what they had. I want you to understand this. They had Yeshua. They had Jesus. So do I. So do you. What more do you need? So let's read it. In Acts 3, verse 2, a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, and when they laid him at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, the Beautiful Gate, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms, Notice he didn't ask for healing. This guy can't move. Lame completely. He's asking for money. Fixing his eyes on him, verse 4, Acts 3, verse 4, with John, Peter said, look at us. 
So he gave them attention, expecting to receive something from them. And then did they ever? And then Peter said, silver and gold, I don't have. I have none. But what I do have, what I do have, you can say that. I can say that. Ministers who are praying for healing for others say that. I have nothing to give you, but what I have is Jesus himself inside of me. What I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And notice what Peter does before his feet and bones were healed. He took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And then, and immediately, his feet and ankle bones received strength. Talk about faith. I don't have any money, but what I have, I'm going to give you. Rise up. In Jesus' name, be healed. And he was. We too must come to believe that we have Jesus Christ in us to give to others. And we can proclaim in the healing in the name of Jesus. Whenever you're praying about something, whether you're blessing the food, thanking God for the food, always end all your prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Make that a habit. Point number three. So point number two, recognize the power you have. Incredible power. Point number three, ask and believe that you will receive what you've already, what you've asked about. Let me say it again. Ask, ask and believe that you will receive and have already received what you asked for, even before you actually see it. Believe you've already received it. There's a story of the fig tree. I'm going to have you read the scripture. I'll put the story up on the screen now. There was a fruitless fig tree that Jesus had come to and it had no fruit. He cursed the fig tree and said, may you never have fruit again and die, basically. And so the, the, the tree died, but it wasn't evident yet immediately. Now we pick up Mark 11, verses 20 to 24. In the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. As Peter, remembering, said, him, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered away. And Jesus says, duh. No. <laughs> Jesus said to him, have faith in God. Don't have faith in me. Don't have faith in the minister anointing you. Don't have faith in the anointed cloth you might get. Don't have faith in anything but God. Have faith in God. For if any of you are having faith in the minister, that's wrong. That's idolatry. Have faith in God. Surely I say to you that whoever says to this mountain, be removed, be cast in the sea, and does not doubt, does not doubt. But we doubt. And we think, but what if it doesn't just get cast in the sea? What if I proclaim healing to this person and he's, he or she's not healed? Must not doubt, but believes that these things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, Mark 11, verse 24. I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. The Holman translation, verse 24, Mark 11, 24 says, Therefore I tell you all the things you pray and ask for. Believe that you have received them. I believe that is the context of the Greek here. Believe that you have received them. And you will have them. What was the context? The fig tree. They didn't see it wither up immediately. It took a day for them to see the tree dead as doornails. We say dead as a fig tree. <laughs> so when did the fig tree die? It actually died immediately. But the evidence of it took a while. I mean, Daniel one time was praying and took three weeks for the angel to get through. To get through the, uh, the evil spirits who were stopping it. I think that's in Daniel 9 or... I think it's Daniel 9. Sometimes God heals at once, which is wonderful. 
Sometimes God takes his time and tests our faith and heals us or intervenes when it seems too late. I mean, when Daniel was being cast into the lion's den, halfway down the, from where he was let go to where the lions were, those lions, I'm sure, were kept hungry. Everybody would have thought it's too late for God to do anything now. But it wasn't. The three friends of Daniel in the fire, as they heated the fire up more and more, and they took the men and threw them in the fire, it wasn't too late. So don't ever doubt. Point number, in fact, I love what they said. Uh, no, we're not going to bow down to your stupid idol. But know this. Our God is able to deliver us from your fire. But if he does not, that's fine. We're still not going to bow down to your idol. That's a wonderful story in that story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Point number four, thank God for answering your prayer even before you've received healing. This proves to God that you believe he's answering. You don't see the answer yet. You're thanking him for something you haven't seen yet, but you're already thanking him. I have a whole sermon on that, thanking and praising God before you see the answers. Go back and hear that, a whole sermon that develops that whole concept. I gave that as a sermon at the Feast of Tabernacles some years ago. Thank God even before you see the answer, before you see the healing. Jesus thanked God, the Father, for hearing him, for having heard him about Lazarus while Lazarus was still dead in the tomb. I'll put in the notes John 11, verses 41 to 44. Then they took away the stone, John 11, 41 to 44, from the place where the dead man had been dead four days already, where the dead man was lying. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. The man was still dead dead in there. He says, I know you always hear me, but I said that for all of them. Verse 43, now when he'd said this thing, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, loose him! Let him go! everybody's hair in the back of their neck and all over their body was standing straight up. <laughs> Can you imagine? But Jesus, my point is, he thanked God while the man was still dead. In my sermon, I go through so many, many stories and examples in the Bible of thanking before they got the answer, praising before they got the answer. Paul and Silas in jail, I think it was in Acts 16, They've been beaten. They probably had broken ribs. They had bleeding stripes on their back. They were in chains. They were in stocks and chains. At midnight, they began to praise and sing. And when they began to praise and sing, their chains fell off. Not until then. When Jesus multiplied the food for the 5,000, he thanked God for multiplying the food, to bless the food, before it had multiplied. So go back. It's a crucial point of faith. You feel so strongly about your faith, you're already thanking God. Are you guys doing this? If you're not doing this, this could be a big reason why we're not getting healed. Start thanking God for the pain, in the pain. Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7, they, that, you know, let your request be made known to God with thanksgiving. Philippians 4, 6. And the peace of God, which goes beyond understanding, will come upon you. Ephesians 5, 20, thanking God in all things, everything. It's not even in my notes, but I'm just saying we've got to get to the point where let our request be made known to God with thanksgiving. 
I don't know how many of you are used to doing that. Father in heaven, I thank you for the pain in my feet. I thank you for this elbow that's not working right. I thank you for my diabetes. I thank you for my cancer. Thank you, thank you, thank you for it and in it. Knowing you will work your mighty miracles the way you see fit. Sounds crazy, but that's what scriptures say. Go back and hear my whole sermon on it. If you're not thanking God in and for your problems, that could be the reason you're still having trouble. Number five, be persistent. Don't give up if you're not healed all at once. Call for anointing. Maybe be anointed again a second time, a few days, weeks later, whatever. I wouldn't keep calling for anointing over and over and over. I, I personally wouldn't. But I'm saying you yourself, Pray to God endlessly about it, thanking him for it, praying about it, repeating it to him. Luke 18, the story of the persistent, the importunate widow, who, in spite of the fact that the judge wouldn't hear her, he, she kept on and on and on. And Jesus says, if that unrighteous judge would do that, how much more do you think God would do, who's a righteous judge, if we keep asking him? At the end of that, it just came to me, Luke 18, verse 8. At the end of that story, he says, but will he find faith on the earth when he returns? In context, he's saying, I don't know if you guys will have faith to keep on asking. You've already asked. The answer wasn't seen, wasn't given that you wanted. And you give up. It's a lack of faith. Be persistent. We're given the example of Elijah that in James 5, 17, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours and he prayed earnestly, it wouldn't rain and it didn't rain for three and a half years. And then he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth produced its fruit. James 5, 17 and 18. The full story actually is that Elijah had to pray seven times after each prayer, he would tell his servant, go tell me if you see any clouds out there yet. Nope. Prayer number two, any clouds yet? Nope. Prayer number three, any clouds yet? Nope. Four, five, six, nope, nope, nope. After the seventh prayer, the servant said, there's a little tiny, tiny little cloud, size of my hand out there, way out in the distance. He got up and he said, that's enough. God's answering the prayer now. God's answering the prayer now. And he told Ahab, better get in your chair. It's going to start raining like crazy. But he had to pray seven times for that to happen. Naaman had to dip in the water more than once, right? Naaman the leper had to dip in the water, I think, seven times, wasn't it? I just thought of that now, too. <laughs> Naaman, don't stop praying. Now, part of the other thing in James 5... Let me read that too. James 5.15, the prayer of faith will save, James 5.15, will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. If he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. Remember that. We're going to use that. He will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Let me say, continue to pray. Continually pray over and over again for the same people who aren't healed yet. Pray for one another that you may be healed. So when I anoint somebody for, for healing, I'm often telling them, I want you to think of people who also need healing. And let's pray for them. Have you pray for them too. And even with Paul Gibson, I was up there, we were anointing him, praying for him. And while we're praying for him, I, I prayed for his sister who needed prayer. I prayed for his sister's daughter and her husband who needed prayer. I prayed for various ones besides Paul. Because of that verse, pray for one another that you may be healed. And he says, confess your sins to one another. Confess your trespasses. No one does that. Maybe that's a whole different sermon, right? So Elijah prayed over and over again. Naaman had to dip seven times and so on. I tell those I'm praying for, remember to pray for others and keep praying yourself. 
Keep asking. Don't stop asking. Every day, several times a day, keep praying, keep asking. That was the case with my plantar fasciitis. I had ripped the, ripped my, with the plantar connects to the, up near the toes and down by the heel, the bottom of your feet, and playing pickleball or whatever. I kept going even though it hurt, stupid, but I did that and finally it ripped out on both ends of the toe end and the heel end of my feet. I couldn't walk. I had to use a, some crutches or cane. I could not put any weight on the foot. The podiatrist said it was the worst case he'd ever seen. He says, you'll never walk again without a walker or a cane. You're certainly not playing pickleball again. Well, when I got home for two weeks, I kept speaking to that foot. And I kept praying for God to heal it in Jesus' name. I kept thanking God for the painful foot. Are these crazy things or not? It's scripture. One week later, still there. Two weeks later, still there. All that horrible pain. It was a little after two weeks, going up to the third week. I woke up one morning and got out of bed. And when I put my feet on the floor... I just suddenly thought, there's no pain. The pain is gone. God didn't heal me right away, but God took two and a half weeks or so. Healed me. But I kept asking, daily, 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 kept asking. Okay, so keep on asking and thanking. Point number six, have the same level of, now this is going to be new for a lot of you. Have the same level of faith for healing that you have for faith for salvation. Even then, I wonder if all of you have the faith for salvation. I wonder if all of you hearing this really believe you have been saved. Or do you think you're going to be saved when Christ returns? Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, For you have been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. You have been saved. I have been forgiven. I have been saved. I have been begotten and born of the Holy Spirit. Now, the same faith that gives me that confidence to believe that is the same faith I need for healing. The two are tied together. I never hear it tied together. And just praying about the sermon, this came to me like this too. And uh, God showed me this in Matthew 8, verses 16 and 17. I'm not the only one probably who preaches this. But in my circles, we, we, we never preached it. I never preached it. Matthew 8, verse 16 and 17. When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed. Remember that. And he cast out the spirits with a word. Threw them out. And healed all who were sick. That it might be fulfilled, spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying... He took, he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. He carried away my sickness upon himself. I know, I knew that he did our sins upon himself. I didn't know he took our infirmities upon himself. Oh, we always use the verse, by his stripes we were healed. But I'm taking it a step further. We can go, like it says in 1 Peter 5, verse 7, I think it is, cast all your cares upon him, for he does care for you. Here he says in Matthew 8, verse 17, the last part of it, he himself took our infirmities, bore our sicknesses. We weren't just healed by his stripes, he took them away. He took our sickness away. This is something we're not preaching enough, if at all. After saying Jesus healed them all, it says he fulfilled something else. He took upon himself all our infirmities and sicknesses, not just our sins. That says that just as Christ has taken away our sins, and we have to have faith in that, he also takes upon himself our infirmities. Claim it. Speak it. 
Call out for it. We know First Peter 2, verses 23 and 24, by his stripes we're healed. We know that. So now when I pray for healing for someone, I ask Yeshua, please, Master, take the pain and suffering this person's going through. Take the paralysis this person has off of this person. Put it upon yourself. Carry it from him. Take it upon yourself. In Jesus' name, in your name. We ask you now that you carry away this misery, this sickness, this pain, this suffering. You take it on yourself, just like you took her sins away from her, if we're talking about a woman. Now take her illness away. You carry it. We can cast our cares upon him, 1 Peter 5, 7. So healing and forgiving our sins are put in the same league, same, they're right here. Start saying that. Start understanding that. Start using that. He took our sins upon himself. Is it possible we're missing a level of sin, being, I mean of healing going on, because we're not doing this? James 5, 16 says, And if they have committed sins, they shall be healed. James 5, 16, and Jesus in John 5, um, don't keep sinning what you're doing. Uh, don't sin anymore like what you're doing or else a worse thing will come upon you. Sin and receiving the forgiveness God gives us and he takes away our sin and receiving the healing where he takes away the, the infirmity are things that we need to put together. Isaiah 53, verse 5, it talks about bruised for infirmities, by stripes were healed. But then uh, Matthew 8, verse 17, let me say it again, that it might be fulfilled, that he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. I'm just saying, when you pray for healing now, claim that one. Don't miss it anymore. I think we'll start seeing more healings if we all do it. Point number seven, speak life and healing to your painful parts and your infirmities. In Luke 4, 38, 39, Peter went to, I mean, Jesus went to Simon Peter's house, found out that Simon's mother-in-law was very badly sick with a real high fever. And in verse 39, Luke 4, 39, so he, Jesus, stood over her and rebuked the fever. You're not just asking God to heal. I'm asking you in Jesus' name, do what Jesus did. Rebuke the cancer. Rebuke the pain. Rebuke whatever it is, the paralysis, the MS, anything. Rebuke it in Jesus' name. And immediately she arose and served them. Speak life and healing. Speak, even if the speaking is to rebuke it. You should ask in Jesus' name that the pain or lump or cancer or cut or whatever it is be healed in Jesus' name. Speak to your pain like I spoke to my feet. I really did. Rebuke the infirmity like I rebuked the plantar fasciitis. Now, there are things, other things I've spoken to and rebuked still I have. That plantar fasciitis, that sure went. Within two and a half weeks later, remember God is in you. God speaks. Jesus spoke. And things happened when they spoke. So in Jesus' name, you have no power, but in Jesus' name, you have all power. There's power in your tongue. Proverbs 18, 21 says, speak life. It says there's the death and life are in the power of the tongue. So speak life to your body. Plantar fasciitis, go, get out of my body. I rebuke you in Jesus' name. He's taking it away from me. He's carrying it upon himself. We had a good friend who had a badly broken leg and ankle from a very bad accident. She was told she's not going to play golf and pickleball ever again either. And when I anointed her and prayed for her, I told her, speak life. Speak life to your feet, to your ankle, your leg. You will be fine. Let's speak life to it. Let's rebuke the pain, rebuke the break. She was doubtful 
God must have honored my faith and not hers because now she's golfing and playing pickleball again. Speak faith and belief. Ask Jesus to carry it away. Something I know we're not doing. Just not ever hear it. I never hear it. Point number eight. Rebuke in Jesus' name one more thing. If you know that you've had something going on for years and years and years, there might well be a spirit of infirmity. We hate to say it. We hate to speak it. Because it sounds like we're telling somebody that they're demon-possessed. It might be. But mostly what I'm talking about is there's just a spirit of infirmity has decided I'm going to afflict this person like in Luke 6, verse 17 and 18. Jesus came down with them, stood on a level place with a crowd of disciples, and all the people from all over came. And they came and healed, and he healed them of all their diseases, Luke 6, 17, as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits. And they were healed. I have never, ever been part of a anointing prayer, except recently here, but before that, where the minister, if, I, if he was the one speaking, ever used this. Matthew 10, verse 1 and 2, And when he had called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal, not to pray for, to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Acts 10, 38, talking about Jesus. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with his Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Why would we think that there were all these people who had illnesses caused by demons you know why? It's because now we have intelligence that says, oh, come on. They thought that person who was uh, mute or dumb was a demon. They didn't realize there was some problem with the inner ear. They didn't realize this or that. Now we know it's not demons. It's physical issues. So we don't do this. I wonder how many are not being healed because we don't do this. I don't know that I would do this right away, but if I suspect there's a demonic power that's trying to afflict a person, do it. Why would this change in our century? In Luke 13, there was a woman in a synagogue who couldn't sit, stand up straight. She was bowed over because, because it says a woman who had uh, Luke 13, verses 10 to 17. Luke 13, verses 10 to 17. He was teaching in the synagogues. He noticed this woman who had, been a, who had a spirit of infirmity, 18 years, was bent over, could in no way raise herself up. Jesus called her, her to him and said, Woman, you're released. You're loosed from your infirmity. He laid hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. They criticized him for healing on the Sabbath. And then Jesus said, you bunch of hypocrites, you would loose a donkey to go out and get some water, but you won't let this woman be loosed on the Sabbath, a day of rest, when she should have been resting from this infirmity that Satan put on her? So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound? There's so many verses that talk about so many illnesses that were caused by demons. I'm not saying they were demon-possessed. I'm saying they were caused by demons. Some were possessed. Mostly they're just caused by it, like this woman. For 18 years, is it not good that she be loose from this bond on the Sabbath? In Luke 10, verses 18 to 20, I think it's when the disciples came back. He said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents. These are demons and scorpions. Another word for demons. And over all the power of the enemy... And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, don't rejoice in this, but, but that the spirits are subject to you. Evil spirits are subject to you. But rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. 
So even rebuke any possible involvement by demonic powers. In Luke 8, verses 1 to 3, we read of a whole bunch of women who helped minister to Jesus with their means, their, their money. And these were women, not just one, but women, plural, who had, had been healed of evil spirits in Luke 8, verses 1 through 3, who had been healed, healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, out of whom came seven demons, and these other women, who it seems to me that they all had been healed of demonic influence illnesses. I don't think that's gone away. Even anointed cloths were taken from Paul, Acts 19, 11 and 12. And even those, it says, diseases left them when they used these little cloths. And the evil spirits went out from them. And in Acts 5, verses 14, verses 14 to 16, believers were increasingly added. They sought just to be in Peter's shadow. And they brought sick, sick people to them and others who were tormented. Verse 16, the end of it who were tormented with unclean spirits. And they were all healed. Again, healing, unclean spirits. There's so many of these verses. The multitudes, Acts 8, with Philip. He wasn't even an ordained elder yet. The multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, seeing the miracles he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. So don't be afraid to do this. Who is in us? God Most High. And he who is in us, 1 John 4, 4, is greater than he who is in the world. Don't fear Satan. He who is in you is greater. Cast them out. So I say today now, when I, when I pray for people, if there's any, any evil spirit of infirmity involved with this, in Jesus' name, get out. I rebuke you in Jesus' name. You have no business hurting this person. None. Get out. In Jesus' name. Do it in Jesus' name. So let's wrap it up. I believe we truly, truly, these are eight points you're going to have to hear this sermon a couple times because these are some things you're not hearing where you're going, whether it's a Protestant church, Catholic church, or, or wherever you're going. I don't think you're getting all these eight points. I don't say that to my glory. I think God's revealing these to us. He wants to heal us. These are the laws of healing. Not even all of them. There are probably eight more we could give. The fervent, effective prayer of the righteous man avails much. Okay? And, and also esteeming the body of Christ. There are so many other points we could add. But pray in Jesus' name, believe, and thank God even for what you know you've already received, even if you can't see it. Believe you've received it, like the fig tree before they saw that it was all dead. So number one, our faith in God must hold strong no matter what, like Abraham did. He was beyond able to cause a child to be conceived, and God still did it. And he trusted God. Point number two, recognize, believe, and accept incredible power. My Father and I will come and make our abode in you. What power we have in Jesus' name. Apart from that, in Jesus' name, we have nothing. With it, we have incredible power. Let's start using it. Don't let, let it lie dormant. Point number three, believe you've already received what you've asked for. Like the fig tree story. Point number four, Therefore, to prove your faith that you've already believed it and received it, thank God like Jesus did Lazarus. Thank God before you see the answer. That proves your faith. Point number five, don't give up. Be persistent. Keep asking. Keep asking like I did the, the plantar fasciitis. Like I did my cancer that I had. That went on for a while. Uh, next one, connect your healing with Christ's salvation and ask him to take your infirmities, not just your sins, but take your infirmities from you. Don't just heal us by your stripes. Take my infirmities off of me. Take them. 
Matthew 8 talked about that. Don't give up. Be persistent. Connect your healing. Okay. Speak life, including rebuke. Speak life to your body, your health, your parts that are hurting. Speak to your body in Jesus' name. I don't mean just the elder. I mean you. You do that. Finally, rebuke any foul spirits of infirmity that may be at work. Rebuke a spirit of infirmities that may be involved. And I think if we all start doing this, all eight of these, we're going to start having some incredible healings. Father in heaven, we come before you again. We raise our hands in prayer and praise to you. We ask in Jesus' name that you will cause the spirit of healing to come again, that you will rebuke the spirits of infirmity when we say so, that you will take from us the infirmities that we have, that you take them from us, that we will be persistent, that you let us, that you know we're not losing faith in you just because you're making us wait to, wait to test our faith. We love you. We look to you. We praise you. We know you can do this, dear God. We know you can. We know you will. Thank you for the healings you have done. We look forward to so many more. Jesus, be our healer. Jesus, hear, hear our prayers. In your name, we praise you, thank you, and do all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting, and if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.